Zechariah. They finished building the um, temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus. Thank you, Cyrus. Remember, Isaiah said he's going to do this. Darius and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar. Adar is in the spring. I think Adar, I may even have it. I think Adar is like our March. You know, the Jews, the Jewish calendar goes by the moon. And our calendar, of course, goes by the sun. And so our dates are sometimes lopsided. But you know, the moon is as consistent as the sun. And you can calculate things on the moon just like you calculate things on the sun. But they work differently. That's why, you know, why are we having Easter on this date and then the next year you got Easter on this date? Well, it's because the true date of Easter is based on, on the moon, not on the sun. So we have to move it around to, to be consistent with the, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, let's turn the page. And I'm on page three in your notes. The year is 516. And I tell you that kind of stuff, the temple. Oh, here's an interesting fact. You know, God says it's going to take 70 years. Okay, isn't that interesting? The Babylonians destroyed the temple in 586. They rebuilt the temple in 516. Do the math. You have 70 years. That's exactly what the prophecy was. Okay. So, um, Okay, as, this is interesting. Ezra's an old guy. I mean, he's like 80. It's just not that old. <laughs> Since I'm the oldest one in the room. Uh, but Ezra is up there. And, you know, it's tough to travel at that time. You know, there's no jet planes leaving town. And that's why then you get in a little tiny bitty cart with a donkey and bunch of other group of people and you, you go all the way up to the top of the Euphrates River and then you come all the way down because you can't go straight across because it's a very harsh desert so to go with the people and the towns and the communities and the protected roads and everything you have to go all the way up north if you want to go over if you're here and you want to go there you gotta go like that to get there uh, and um, but Ezra goes home, and he brings back another group of, um, of immigrants. It's a small group compared to the others, but nevertheless, it's another group. And he, he uh, is now over 80 years old. And in chapter 7, I want us to read uh, verses uh, uh, 6 through 10. <coughs> And it says in six, seven, chapter 7, uh, verse 6, This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the laws of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked. Isn't it amazing? I mean, God's got to turn their head to do that. Because traditionally, Jews are not liked people, which I actually think is an interesting point about the spirit of the Antichrist. One of the main parts or characteristics of the spirit of the, of the Antichrist is to murder every Jew. That's part of the passion of the Antichrist. And people who have that spirit of the Antichrist uh, are... are very violent in their mind anyway about the Jews so the king had granted him everything he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was on him some of the Israelites including priests Levites singers gatekeepers and temple servants also came up to Jerusalem 
in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king and had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month. So it took him about four months of travel to go from Babylon to Jerusalem, four months. And he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. For the good hand of the Lord was on him, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and the observance of the law of the Lord and to uh, teaching its decrees and the laws of Israel. And that's basically what you're doing tonight. Is you're stuttering, stuttering. Okay. You're studying the Word of God. And that God is honored by that. It says in, in Psalms that God loves those who know Him. There's only one way to know Him, to study Him, like Ezra did. Ezra is highly thought of in, in God's eyes. Why? Because Ezra sought to know God. And, you know, I got the spirits of God, seven spirits of God. Three of them have to do with the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, and the spirit of wisdom. And they're connected. Because if you don't have the spirit of knowledge, which you're doing right now, you, you can't ever get to a point where you understand how God does things and how God thinks and trust how much God loves you. You gain that strength through knowledge, and the knowledge then leads to understanding, and then the understanding leads to wisdom. You just don't jump in the boat the first day and, and, and have wisdom. Some do, but that's a movement of God, because the way it, we typically do it is you learn about God, you begin to understand God, and then you begin to move in his wisdom. It's a, it's a sequence, and that's what Ezra did. Okay, so, let's look at, um, well this is more about Ezra, but I'm, I'd like to read this to you. Uh, Ezra <coughs> 7, 21 through 23, by the way, how do the other teachers teach you? Uh, do they do the reading or do they have you do the reading? We read. And do you like to do the reading? Some people like to read out loud and enjoy it, and other people don't. And I, you're always a little awkward about, well, like up at Canby with my students, I make them read. <laughs> they don't get a choice. But, you know, with you people, you, you should have a choice there. So if you don't like to read out loud in front of a group, that's fine with me. But if some of you like to do that and like to participate in the reading, let me know. I like to be reading it personally. You would rather have me do it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I like her. <laughs> no, I, have, I just, I get more out of it when you're No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but, okay. So, I mean, if you people say, well, I can read too, you know, that's fine with me. Okay, so let's go back to verse 21 here in Ezra 7. Now I, King Artaxerxes, he's speaking, order all the trade. Now remember, this is the guy that shut Israel down. Like, probably no more than a year ago. Yeah. No more, less than a year, he shut Israel down. This same guy. Uh, order all the treasures of Trans um, Euphrates to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law of God of heaven, may ask of you. And interesting. I mean, he literally like gives Ezra a blank check. In, in Persia, uh, and then it talks about all the kinds of things he, he means by that, which is money. Um, verse 23, 
whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple of the God in heaven. Why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and of his sons? Uh, so it's kind of interesting that these, all these guys who were trying to poison the minds of the kings of Persia, you know, they had their little play. And it's kind of like, you know, people that are ungodly do ungodly things. And you say, wow, this person has done this to me and it really upsets me, or they've done this to one of my friends and it really upsets me, and why does that happen? Hey, just take a deep breath and wait a while, very short while, or maybe a long while, but it will reverse. God will not let that happen. He, you know, even David says, yeah, I look at evil people and they're like flowers, you know, they flourish and they're really doing good and then you look back and they're gone. It's the same thing here. And so you see, all of a sudden, all these people spitting out this venom, venom, Lemon. Uh, <laughs> I get for using the word um, uh, I, I, yeah, against Israel. Suddenly, this has come back on them, and now they're just they're seen as the problem. Okay, so um, there. Let's go. Um, oh, this is re This issue will get you. This is heavy. You remember when? Um, uh, Moses and Israel was in the wilderness and God told them when you get to the promised land there's certain things you need to not do. You need to not live with these pagans because they'll corrupt your culture and they'll corrupt your people. Uh, so you don't live with them and you don't marry their sons and daughters because the parents will want to raise the children as pagans. You got to keep yourself pure. And you got to keep yourself apart from all this spiritual pollution that's going on. And the third thing, you don't worship their gods. You know, today we might say the god of materialism, the god of lots of other things, you know, that we worship or or can or are tempted to, you know, we don't have Baal today, pretty much, but, but we have a lot of people who worship nature and think God is in nature. God is not in created things. God's a creator. So you don't worship created things. Uh, you can be nice to nature, <laughs> and nature's nice to us, you know, but you don't worship it. Nature is not God. Nature is a created thing. Amen. And uh, so, th so there's lots of differences here. So one of the things was marriage. That's a biggie. That's a biggie. Well, these people were in captivity for 70 years. That is an entire generation at least, right? Well, they get over there and they're out of their environment, they're out of their culture. Um, a lot of the Jews don't really still study the law. And so what happens? They start marrying women, particularly men marrying women in the pagan culture. And I'm sure lots of Jewish women were marrying pagan men. Okay, so you got this intermarriage scene going. Now that's really touchy. And look at this, look what happens here. Let's go to Ezra 9, 1 through 4. Pretty good. Uh, well, you know, since I told you about it, let's just go to 4. I'm going to take 3, 3 and 4. Okay, this is in chapter 9. And Ezra. Is, is realizing that a lot of these Jews that came back brought <coughs> pagan women with them as wives and their children. And it says in 3, Ezra says, When I heard this, 
I tore my tunic, tunic, my t I tore my tunic and my cloak, pulled hair from my head, wow, and my beard, and sat down appalled. Then everybody who trembled at the words of God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles, the exiles being all of the um, uh, pe the Jewish people that were coming home. That's what they were exiled for. Uh, and I sat there, okay, then um, let's go to uh, Ezra uh, 10. I want to take Ezra 10, verse 2. It says, then she... Yes, it would be Shechaniah, 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 son of, oh my gosh, uh, Jehel, I guess, Jehel, yeah, Jehel, one of the descendants of Elam said to Ezra, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women. Would you see the issue coming up now? Uh-oh, what are we going to do? We have women that we're married to. Many, many of us love our wives. We have children, the children um, of a pagan woman. And God, that was a direct law. It was one of the biggest laws that God gave Moses to Israel. Don't marry these people. Well, they have. And so what are they going to do now? And it says, we have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now, let us make a covenant before the Lord to send them away, all of the women and their children, in accordance with the counsel of our Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be according to the law. Raise up. This matter is in your hands. Uh, rise up. I'm sorry. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you. So take courage and do it. These people are being told to send their families, their wives and their children back to Persia. And I, you know, you can imagine um, that there were so many families that had an emotional commitment, but it wasn't spiritually healthy or safe. And so it says in here, and let's go to 10, um, 10, 10, and, and you can find the grief that these people are, are suffering under. And in Ezra 10.10 10, it says, Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. You see? So the problem, you know, the prop, in Leviticus it says, If you sin and you didn't know it was a sin, you're still responsible. And the Jews were told that back in the days of Moses. If you sin because you don't know the law, you're still responsible. <laughs> it's kind of like the peace officer uh, who uh, pulls you aside and says you were doing 50 in a 35 zone. And you say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was a 35 zone. And the officer says, oh, okay, well, if you didn't know it, it's okay, but just don't do that. And no, they don't say that, do they? <laughs> yeah. the ignorance in the law is no excuse. And they still slap you with a ticket, you know. Uh, and it's the same thing. God's doing the same thing here. He's saying, I know you were ignorant, but ignorant of, uh, ignorance of the law does not excuse the sin. Plus, especially when you become aware now I'm aware of it, then it's double your responsibility. And so these people are being responsible. And it says, you're adding to Israel's guilt. Now make confession. Isn't that what it's all about? 
we make confession, we repent, and we are what? Forgiven. Forgiven. That's the relationship of our covenant with God. That's our relationship. It's a sincere, intimate relationship. It's got to be sincere, and it's got to be intimate, and that's how it works. Now make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do His will. Separate yourself from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. And the whole assembly responded in a loud voice, You are right. We must do this. And it goes on to talk about the weeping and the crying and the goodbyes, but they do that. Now that is remarkable righteousness. That's putting God first above all the kinds of things um, in your life that you value. And these people did that. And that is a, just a remarkable um, statement about how serious uh, they were. And so, um, Now we're going to go to Nehemiah, and we have about mm, 12 minutes. Yeah, 12 minutes. I'm getting a nod from the back of the room. So, um, but this will be good. We'll introduce Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes around during Ezra's life, but Ezra is a lot older than Nehemiah. But they knew each other. And Nehemiah. Is, is almost like a Daniel, not nearly, not that high, but he's very important. Nehemiah is important in the Persian government. In fact, it'll tell you uh, at the end of verse 11 that Nehemiah was the cup holder to the king. Now, you know, you think, well, that's nice. He was the servant of the king. He bought it. He brought him some wine and blah, blah, blah. But no, no. The cup holder of the king was the person who was responsible for purchasing, the handling, the preparing, everything that touched the king's lips. Not only was he responsible for it, but he had to test it so that if there was any any sort of assassination attempt that got by him, he'd die. But he was there to protect the king from any sort of attempted assassination. So a cupbearer was an extremely important person because they had to have 100% of the trust of the king because the king literally was placing his life in their hands and you had to be really good and important and trustworthy to be there and Nehemiah the Jew was the cupbearer for the Persian king extremely important position and God begins to put it on his heart you need to get involved in this trek home now remember what I said, the Jews that came home were the really righteous Jews. The other Jews that stayed were Jews that kind of become comfortable in the Babylonian culture. And like the Pers the Persians and the Babylonian, Babylonians were unusual and ran in a different direction than most pagan foreigners in that they were fair. They, they basically had fair laws, so you could be a foreigner and exist in their country rather decently. That was not usually the case in most of these lands, but among the Babylonians and also among the Persians, they were quite tolerant. I know Persia gets bad press because of the Greek wars, you know, Thermopylae Pass and Battle of Marathon, things like that, and the Greeks are seen as heroes, but actually the Persians were a lot more tolerant people than the Greeks. The Greeks were, yeah, we've got it made, we've got democracy, we've done this wonderful thing, now everybody in the world needs to be a Greek. 
and you better be one. You know, the Persians never said that. They were tolerant about other people. Uh, so anyway, uh, God begins to put on Nehemiah's mind all these, all these um, passions about going home and being part of this um, movement. Let's pick it up in 1-3, 1-3 and 4. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. Now, this is going to upset Nehemiah. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. Um, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now what's happening here is, remember, they said, yes, we'll rebuild that temple first because the most important thing is our relationship with you and then we'll work on this other stuff. Well, that's exactly what's happened. But now you have these people who are 